Thank you, Noah. Good morning. It is a good morning. It's a blessing to be here. It's a blessing to have a spiritual family here as well as real family. It's good to be together. I am hoping to share with you a little bit of archaeology this morning, just a little bit. Uh, some of you know that I took a class on it, and so there's some interesting information I think that might be helpful. I promise it won't take too much time for those of you who can't handle archaeology. But uh, there it's interesting to see how God has really pulled some things together, and the more we study history, the more we see God in a very real way. Um, I just got an article from one of you this week, and they have found more things even this week that are affirming that we have a Bible that could be depended upon. And that is, that's always really good news. Our sermon this morning is Moses' choice. And I'd like to just ask if you would bow your heads with me. Father, this morning, I want to ask that you would take the vessel and that you would fill me with your spirit. It's the only way that this message will be heard. I pray that you bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. When Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand, let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell, O Pharaoh, let my people go. Thomas Carlyle said, the history of the world is but the biography of great men. And while that statement comes under some fire for the definition of what is great and what is men, the reality is that people make choices that determine the history of our world. Great people can change it either positively or by negative ways. Few of us, I think, will ever forget the brilliant writings of Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be what? Self-evident that all men are created equal. Some of us, few of us, will probably ever forget a man by the name of Winston Churchill who stood strong in the darkest hours of World War II with Great Britain. But we also don't forget the incredible Nazi regime under Adolf Hitler or the traitorism that was seen under Benedict Arnold in Quiesling. History truly is seen in the lives of people. And probably for no other person more so than Moses. Moses is probably one of the greatest, arguably the greatest leader of God's people in the Old Testament. You see, Pharaoh, Amenhotep I, had a problem. His problem was this. It was a Hebrew problem. They had cleaned their country of a group of people called the Hyksos. And they had removed him, but there were some relatives of the Hicksaws that were still there. They were, they were kind of distant cousins, if you will. We would call them Israelites. 
And Amenhotep said, we need to get rid of them. His father and his father before him had enslaved the Hebrews, but they kept growing and multiplying. It didn't seem to be much they could do with them. Amenhotep I would have taken care of the problem, but he couldn't because his biggest issue was just getting the political foundation set up for the new kingdom, the new dynasty of Egypt. So he left it to his son, Thutmose I. Thutmose I uh, decided he would solve his problem by taking baby boys and throwing them into the river. Of course, it didn't work because of some God-fearing midwives. But there was a command that was given, and there was a mother who had faith. What was the name of the mama of Moses? I just asked this to the junior class today. Jochebed, that's right. So Jochebed took her baby. I don't know what she named him, but she took her baby and she put that baby into the River Nile with little sister Miriam to watch over. Well, Thutmose the first, his plans were foiled because his daughter happened to come down to the river to bathe. And her name was most likely, and we're giving you, based upon chronology, this is what fits most likely. Her name was Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut. Some of you may be familiar with Hatshepsut if you've studied archaeology or Egyptology. So Hatshepsut was the son of Thutmose I and his royal wife. But see, Thutmose I had a nun royal wife. I don't know if you want to call it, maybe a commoner wife. And they had a son from that union, and his name was, hard to believe, Thutmose II. So we have Thutmose II and Hatshepsut. They would be called stepbrother and sister, yes? Common father, different mothers. Well, Hatshepsut found this little baby and adopted him. Her husband was her stepbrother, Thutmose II, because that was very common, and they needed, she, she was of royal blood, and her brother really wasn't fully royal, so if they put them together, that would make his pharaohship legitimate. So now you have stepbrother and stepsister married together, Hatshepsut with Thutmose II. Kind of a weird story, isn't it? You think we've got interesting stories in our society? We do, but it has, it's nothing new, okay? So now you have this interesting union, and Thutmose II followed his daddy's example, and he got himself a nun royal wife. So now Thutmose II has Hatshepsut and adopted son Moses. Thutmose II marries another, and they have a son, really original name. You want to guess? Thutmose III. Very good. So now you have Moses and Thutmose III growing up together. They're not related at all, but they're growing up simultaneously. Can you imagine what that was like? Two boys growing up together, trained by the same teachers, possibly in the same schools. One of them is going to be Pharaoh. Which one is it going to be? An interesting question, isn't it? And Thutmose the first, before Thutmose the third came along, had saw Moses and said, I like him. He's got a lot going for him. In fact, I might even have that quote somewhere, but I don't have it yet. Hatshepsut, her husband, Thutmose the second died after only four years. So he died long enough to have a baby, Thutmose the third, and she had her adopted son, Moses. Thutmose the second now passes from the scene after only four years of reigning as Pharaoh. And that means Hatshepsut, who wants her adopted son to be on the throne, has to buy some time. And so she declares herself the she-king of Egypt. Amazing. 
Uh, amazing story. Hatshepsut, she uh, has feminine names uh, that she took from feminine gods, yet sometimes she would actually use the ceremonial beard that kings would use. Uh, these are some pictures from archaeology from her. Uh, she was not a warrior king, as you could probably guess. Thought most the first was. Hatshepsut actually spent her life increasing the um, trade routes into the southern area. One of those was the expedition into Punt. This is her mortuary temple, the one in the top in the center. There on the left is a aisle, a walkway with carvings on it that describes her expedition into Punt. And then on the far right, there in the center, that's Hatshepsut Sup herself, if you can recognize it at the distance you're at. So uh, this is a little picture of uh, Hatshepsut and her life. Unfortunately for Hatshepsut, while she was reigning, later Thutmose III said it was a co-reign. You know how you can rewrite history if you need to. But while she was reigning, her adopted son made a really bad move. Yes, he decided that he was going to take and uh, put things in his own hand. I won't go into all that quite yet, but to tell you that Hatshepsut, because of her connection with that adopted son, and also the fact that she had some run-ins with the priest of Egypt, her next ruler, Thutmose III, her stepson, or her nephew, who, whatever you want to call him, he erased her. And you can just see right here, he actually went through and tried to erase her name out of the different parts of Egypt because he didn't want anyone to know about Hatshepsut. Well, she has an incredible mortuary temple, which you just saw, so he wasn't able to erase it too well. The mistake was this. Her adopted son, in his heart, did not forget that he was a Hebrew. And he went out and he saw what was taking place. He saw the beatings that were taking place of his people. And one day, not this picture, obviously, but one day when there was no one around, it seemed just to be the, the taskmaster, the Egyptian taskmaster and the Hebrew slave. Moses stepped in and removed that man. As soon as it was found out, Thutmose III, who had been looking for a good reason to get rid of his rival, now had it. And Moses escaped. Moses, however, was a master general. In fact, he was the master general of Egypt when he was growing up. This was 40 years old when this happened. And so he escapes into the wilderness, and uh, there is no way on earth anyone's going to find him because he is a special forces. He knows what he's doing. You're not going to catch him. He disappears. He's gone. No one knows where Moses went to. And for all practical purposes, to the Egyptian court, Moses is dead interesting story. The background. Thutmose now runs a solo reign. And about five years before an event you would call the Exodus, I would call it that too, Thutmose III dies. And his son, Amenhotep II, comes to the throne. I think I have some pictures of Thutmose III, though, here first. This is some Syrian slaves in the middle. They're not uh, Israelite slaves. They're Syrian slaves. But this is from that time period. This is Thutmose III's slaves. There's Thutmose III on the left making an offering to the gods. And then on the far right, uh, uh, the, what do you call it, the bust of Thutmose III. Amenhotep II was cruel, ruthless man. And uh, I'd like to go through three things today in the life of Moses. With that introduction, uh, I like to suggest maybe the introduction was as long as the sermon, so don't get too stressed. We're going to look at several points in the life of Moses that we see in this time frame. If you open up your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. Verse 1 tells us that there was a man born of the tribe of Levi, and that was Moses. Moses was of the tribe of Levi. Uh, his father and mother, Amram and Jochebed. He was hid on the river Nile. In verse 10, 
it tells us this. Verse 9, excuse me. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, that is Jochebed, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So Jochebed was given her own son to nurse and she was paid to take care of her own son. It was a great story how that happened. Um, For the sake of time, we're not going there at this time. Then in verse 10, it says, and the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. So we have Moses raised until he's weaned and a little bit later by his Hebrew mom, trained in the ways of God. Then he is taken and given to Hatshepsut. And notice what it says in verse 11. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was what? Grown. Moses grew up as the son of Hatshepsut. What was that like? What would have Moses' training have been like? You know, we don't have to guess too much. We turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7. This is a interesting part of the sermon of Stephen right before he is stoned. Acts chapter 7. And verse 22, Acts 7, 22. So we want to find out what was uh, Moses' life like in Egypt? Um, did he just kind of grow up as a commoner? Uh, he was trained as Pharaoh a little bit. Let's, let's see what it says here. 7, 22. 7, verse 22. It says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. How much of the wisdom of Egyptians was Moses trained in, according to this verse? All of it. And how would you describe his words and deeds? Mighty. The Bible says mighty. He was a phenomenal character. In fact, uh, here is a statement from a, a youth magazine. Well, over 100 years ago. Here's what it says. Moses was chosen for a special work. Having been adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, he was greatly honored in the king's court. Everyone was intensely desirous of exalting him. Pharaoh determined to make him his successor on the throne. He was good. He was talented. And that talent showed out. People could see it easily. Then it goes on and says this. Moses was a man of intelligence. In the providence of God, he was given opportunity to gain a fitness for a great work. He was thoroughly educated as a what? As a general. When he went out to meet the enemy, he was what? Successful. And on his return from battle, his praises were sung by who? The whole army. I have a question for you, and this is important for this first point here. What would you have done if you were Moses? You are living a Christian life. You haven't given in to the religiosity of the Egyptian court. In spite of that fact, Pharaoh still thinks you're the best one to take his place. Your peerless skills as a general and a statesman, what would you have done? Stay in Egypt and become the famous pharaoh of the 18th dynasty? Think about it. As a pharaoh, your whims become commands. What you want just simply happens. All the wealth you want, the spouse you want, the knowledge of almost unlimited power. Pharaohs lived in the lap of luxury. Unlike anything that we've seen in our modern age today, it was phenomenal. What would you have done? Would you say, I've got great influence. I might as well use my influence here. Let me just do it for God. I could justify that. What would you have done? The book of Hebrews simply says this, and Noah read it to us this morning, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He forsook Egypt. You know, there was no better choice that Moses could have made. It's better to live with the despised than to live with the royal unrighteous. Why? Because our light affliction, which is but for a moment, does what? 
it works for us a far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory. What you face here is light. While we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Moses understood it. It's not what you see that's real sometimes. It's what you can't see that's real. The problem is you and I live in a world that is based upon sight. And what I see is real. I know that's the way I have to face life at times. But God wants us to get beyond the seen to see the unseen. And for us to get there, I propose that there needs to be a change in the way we live sometimes. We need to stop living our life focusing on the seen. It's hard. And what I'm about to say, some of you, I hope, don't take offense, but I must speak as straight as I can do. And that is, if you live your life focusing on the seen, it's going to be very hard for you to see the unseen. If you spend all your life focusing on that which is the things of this world, it's going to be very hard for you to comprehend the things of God. Take some time. I challenge you. This is for me, it's for you, because we all live in a world that's full of seen things. Take some time to see the unseen. Spend time with God. Take some time. For some of you, it may be in the morning. Some of you, maybe the evening. Sometimes it might be the middle of the day. But take time to spend with God. Read His Word. Pray to Him. Talk to Him. Let Him speak to your heart. Each one of us has a different life. I used to be pretty dogmatic, and everyone had to do everything a certain amount of time, a certain time of the day, and everything like that. I don't do that anymore, but I do know one thing. We need to spend time with Him. Because when I focus on the unseen, then I'm prepared to see the unseen. I don't know what else to call this. I realize I should have called it another name, but I call it the hiatus in Midian. This is the middle time. He left, fled Egypt at age 40, and he spends 40 years in the wilderness. I could also call this a school. Um, why did he flee Egypt? I know it's very simple. I just want to ask you, why did he flee Egypt? He was going to be killed, right? So Thutmose III is after him. So he's fled Egypt because uh, it's not a good time. Exodus chapter 2, and that's where our story is, has been. In Exodus chapter 2, it says he arrives in a place called Midian. He arrives in a place called, oh, Exodus chapter 2. Thank you, ma'am. In verse 21. Exodus chapter 2. And verse 21, he arrives in Midian, and after spending some time here, the Bible says in verse 21, then Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah his daughter to Moses, and she bore him a son. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. So he marries Zipporah. He has sons, as we will see later. What an interesting state for Moses to be in. He was once the favored general of Egypt, and now he's in Midian. Can I use the phrase hiding out? Kind of hoping that everyone forgets about him. You know, this happened in World War II. After the Nazis were uh, destroyed at the, at the end of World War II, a lot of the leadership of the Nazis fled to South America. And they tried to completely turn their lives, change over. So no one knows who they are, change their names, change passports, and just become a new person and live out the rest of their lives unknown. And that's what you see Moses trying to do. I'm getting away to another place, and I'm just going to live my life unseen. He might have been unseen to the Egyptian court, but he was not unseen to God. In fact, God had it planned for him to be there. This is also from that same magazine I quoted earlier. In order to prepare Moses for his work as the general of Israel, God removed him from Pharaoh's court and placed him in, the word says, another school. And then it says this, the school of, the school of self-denial, and what's the next word? Hardship. Ay, ay, ay. I don't like that. I was sitting at men's fraternity a few weeks ago. And I heard one of us make a comment. 
Back when I was younger, you can tell it wasn't me. Um, <laughs> back when I was younger, we worked six days a week, hard. We didn't relax and play in the evenings. We worked. And then when we had a special time off, we go to visit a relative and we work there. You might know who that was if I kept telling the story. But those were days of hardship. But it is in the school of hardship that God makes men and women. I don't like what I just told you, but it's the reality of life. When life was harder, oftentimes there were men and women who were stronger. Why do you exercise? Herman, why do you exercise? I'm sorry, you're sitting in the front row, so I'm going to pick on you. To stay in shape? Huh. Isn't it hard staying there and just pushing that weight up? Yes? Okay. If any of you have exercised, it's hard. I went out for a run yesterday afternoon. I had missed one in the morning, and I was, well, it wasn't my fault. It was my wife's fault. She was determined she was going to exercise yesterday afternoon no matter what. And I said, well, if she's going to do it, so can I. <laughs> so I got on my running shoes, and I went out and ran. And I tell you, halfway through the second mile, I was thinking, what am I doing? This is hard. But you know, it's when you do hard things that muscle grows. Yes? And it's the same thing spiritually. When you're in the school of hardship, it's then that spiritual muscle grows. What do we call spiritual muscle? call it faith. The leader of the Egyptian armies went into the mountains to become a keeper of sheep. What a change in his life and employment. Looking at the experience from a human point of view, men would pronounce it what? It is. I am convinced sometimes that when I go through hardship, it's a waste of time. But God looks and it says, Chuck, it's just what you need. God looks at the difficulties we face sometimes and says, it's the school that I need you to be in. With all of Moses' talent, with all the fabulous wealth at his fingertips, he didn't have what it took to be a great leader. He needed hardship to make him a great leader. It's self-denial and hardship. You know, when you wonder where money is coming from to pay bills, when you struggle six days a week to make ends meet, here's a thought for you. Don't despise the school of hardship. When you're wondering what's going to happen to your family, when you're worried about your children and your grandchildren. Don't despise the school of hardship. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, starting with 2, says, Count it all joy when you fall into divers. I'm sorry, King James Version. That's the only one I memorized it. Different temptations. Knowing this first, that the trying of your faith works patience. God wants to do something in us. Don't despise the school of hardship. Psalms 94 verse 12 is another verse that you may want to write down and not like, but here it is. Psalms 94 verse 12. Blessed is the man whom the Lord chastens. Wait a minute, God. I thought blessed is the man who has it. No. Blessed is the man who has this or that. No. Blessed is the man whom the Lord chastens. Some of you are questioning Christianity right about now. I hope not. Because God uses the school of hardship to do miracles in our lives. I'm looking out on the faces of you all here this morning. And I know many, many stories in this room. And I know that hardship exists. And I want to tell you that God has made you great men and women because of it. 
It's hard. But I know that God is doing miracles. I see it. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. First, he forsook Egypt. Then he had his school time in Midian. And then finally, God used him to become a deliverer. This is uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. You may be still there. I hope so. Exodus 2, verse 23 says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. That's Thutmose III. So Thutmose III has died. And then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of their bondage. So Thutmose III's son, as some archaeologists are pretty sure it was his son, did not take the name Thutmose IV. He became Amenhotep II. And he was a cruel, powerful king. They said that uh, he, was, he was a famous archer. And they have, of course, this is written from his perspective. He says, or the historians that he paid say this. When he would shoot a bow, an arrow, the arrow would go through a piece of copper as thick as a man's hand. He was a warrior that no one could stand in front of. Uh, one thing that we do know is on his birthday, or is either his birthday or his ascension to the throne, they're not quite sure which one it was, he actually had a whole group of people brought in that were his enemies and killed him in front of me as part of the celebration. Cruel, a cruel man. And so when it says here in verse 23, the children of Israel groaned because of their bondage and they cried out, it's true. It's the experience that they're feeling. And then verse 24 says this. So God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God, what? Acknowledged them. Please note, when they were in hardship, because it wasn't only Moses who was in hardship, the children of Israel were in hardship. Notice what happens. Verse 24, it says, God did what? God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with them. And verse 25, God looked upon them and God acknowledged them. That's an awesome God we serve. When you're in hardship, do not think that God does not hear. When life is difficult, don't think that God has forgotten you. And when you think that no one can see what you're facing, God looks upon it. And more than that, I love that last phrase, God acknowledges. Praise God. God acknowledges. This is the kind of relationship that the Lord had with the Hebrews while they were in Egypt in bondage. God knows what a slave is going through. Then God reveals himself. Chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him, that is Moses, in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. And we're familiar with that story. And if we're not, please read it, because I need to go through to the, the next section here. God reveals himself to Moses. And then here's what he says to Moses in verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Verse 9. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come up to me, and I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them. Three times now, God says, I see it and I hear it. When God repeats something three times that fast, I hope you're paying attention. God sees and God hears. There are times when you're in your house alone and you think that no one else knows God sees and he hears. There are some who kneel down and weeping because no one else knows God sees and he hears. There are some crying out in anger at God. Why, God? Don't worry. He sees and he hears. Some of you are joyful in your life, and I want to tell you God sees and he hears. You don't have to be in hardship for God to see and hear you. Amen? Then in verse 10, it says this, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God sent Moses to go to Amenhotep II and say, let my people go. 
There it is. It's the, the call. He's now being deliverer. And I notice in verse 11 something that is very interesting. The general that was the hero of Egypt, the one who was a mighty statesman, the one who people looked up to and honored because he was mighty in both words and deeds, says this in chapter 3, verse 11. But Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? Well, don't you see, Moses? You're the best suited person out there. Who am I? He finally realized he didn't have what it took to be a leader for God. And when you realize that you don't have what it takes, you're in the right place for God to do something in your life. When you, do, when you realize that you don't have what it takes, you're then in the place to do something great for God. When you realize that you don't have what it takes, it's then that you're in the right place to do something great for God. God is looking for people who recognize their inability and his ability. And when we reach that, God does great things and makes deliverers of us for someone else or in our own homes. Then in Exodus chapter 7 through 10, chapter 7 through chapter 10, you see the plagues poured out, this battle between Amenhotep II and Moses. But notice what it says in Genesis chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11, sorry. Exodus chapter 11 and verse 3. Exodus chapter 11 and verse 3. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was what? Very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Moses was great before, but this is different. You see, when you are spiritually connected with God, greatness takes on a new level. Um, for example, who are the, in a gang, who's the leader? Would you say the toughest guy? The best fighter? Oftentimes, yes. The guy who can fight the best in a gang, he's probably going to be the leader of the gang. Um, who is the leader inside a government? The smartest guy? Well, maybe not necessarily, but that's the theory, right? You're, the, the smarter people are the ones who end up in Congress. I'm just saying, right? That's the theory. The smartest people rule the nations. But did you realize that there's a level that's above physical leadership and a level that's above intellectual leadership? There's another level. It's called spiritual leadership. And spiritual leadership, those people control everybody. You, you understand what I'm saying, right? Think about it. Pope Francis, would you say he's a spiritual leader? Absolutely. Absolutely. Whether you like it or not, that's who, he's a spiritual leader. He has incredible power in the world. How many of you have heard of a guy named Billy Graham? Presidents, one after another, would go to Billy Graham and ask for advice. Why? Because he was a spiritual leader. What I'm saying is spiritual leaders have power over intellectual leaders. Intellectual leaders have power over physical leaders. The top of the rung is a spiritual leader. If you want to be at the top in making a change, it may not be the school you go to. It may be the God you serve. I'd like to share a few things as we close. Life lessons from Moses. First one, forsake Egypt. Live for what is really real. Yes? Focus on real things. I don't have it on me. But my phone... I desperately need my phone. I don't, sometimes I realize that that phone is with me way too much. That phone is kind of real, but it's not truly real. The phone can keep me focused on a lot of other things, especially if I get in social media. Because social media, you realize you can fake it in social media. Don't raise your hand, but I bet some of you here probably faked it on social media sometime in your past, right? Social media is a fake place. 
It's not real. But here is a real place. Heaven is a real place. Humility is a real place. But sometimes we look at power, wealth, fame, and we think that's what real is. Live for what's really real. Next, trust the school of hardship. I don't know what school you face right now in hardship, but I want to encourage you that if you're in the school of hardship, as most of us are, don't despise it because God does great things in that school. And the last point, be great, humble yourself. If you want to truly be great, be humble in the eyes of God. Moses started out simple peasant child. Moses, supposed to be dead, adopted by a princess, climbed to the top of his nation, and then God said, I need to train you. And he gave him a school of hardship. Then, after 40 years in the school of hardship, if you've been in the school of hardship for a while, don't worry, Moses was there for a while too. He came back out, and God used him to do one of the greatest things that's ever been done in the history of our world. Take over a million people and transport them from one place to the next by the grace of God. God bless you. Do you want to have that kind of greatness? I do. Do you want to be used by God? I do. May God give you strength to that. And can we pray together as we close? Father in heaven, we've looked at the life of Moses this morning, and we realize that he forsook what many of us would probably value and took on what most of us would despise so that he could be truly great in your eyes. Give us, Father, the courage to trust you and your leading in our lives. Bless our homes and bless each person that's here this morning. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing our closing song, um, it is a prayer song. And in other words, it's a song that's sung to God. And I pray that as you sing it, it will be your prayer as well. <laughs>